Hello everyone and welcome back to the True Footy YouTube channel. This time I'm finally getting around to uh, having a more in-depth look at how the West Coast Eagles went at the 2023 draft. Of course, I've done a bit of content wrapping the draft generally, um, and I excluded West Coast analysis in that because I like to do the West Coast videos separately for you. And I know that a lot of you go for West Coast, and naturally I, I kind of find it easier to talk for a little bit longer on the West Coast Eagles stuff. So this video is wrapping how we went uh, both in the national draft as well as the rookie draft and uh, the Cat B signing that we made as well. So it's a little bit of an insight into the players that we got and some of my general thoughts on the matter. Now, obviously, West Coast took pick one in this year's draft and took Harley Reid. I've already kind of covered this in depth. Uh, in between day one and two, I think I made a video called uh, Harley Reid is a new Prince of Perth. So that's kind of like my actual reaction to us drafting Harley Reid. So I'll, I'll keep the, the Reid analysis pretty minimal in this particular video. Other than to say perhaps... One thing I've kind of noticed is that, uh, I'm sure we've all noticed that uh, to a large extent, Harley Reid has been absolutely milked by the West Coast Eagles uh, social media team, uh, which is interesting. And I don't know if I have a criticism as such, but it's an interesting observation, uh, the way that we are already choosing to market this kid. And I guess there may be some concerns, I guess, over subconsciously, you know, putting a lot of pressure on this kid's shoulders. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I suppose every club in the league would probably do the same thing. Uh, we're at a critical time here in terms of off-field branding, I think. At least internally, West Coast will be thinking that. Selling hope to fans, having something to get excited about. And I, I've commented in the past how one of the biggest um, marketing icons this club has ever had, Nick Natanui, has just retired. And I kind of felt like one of the decisions or aspects of the decisions going into uh, this Harley Reid selection would be that we would have a new poster boy. I guess my only concern is that we have to remember he's an 18 year old kid and um, I have to make sure that we're not putting too much pressure on this kid and distracting him too much for footy. At the moment, it's just the national draft and the social media stuff has been really good and really funny in some ways as well. Uh, but it'll be interesting to see what happens from here. Um, I know that we, I heard that we're selling um, Eagles jumpers with the free number nine um, to be ironed on the back as well. So um, they're going ham, but to be honest, that is probably the smart business decision uh, to do, and any club would do the same thing. But interesting thought nonetheless. So that's the Harley Reid selection. Uh, we, that one was a no-brainer. So the, the real draft for us almost started on day two in terms of like difficult decisions to be made. So we had the first selection of day two, and I made a video in between day one and two talking about how we had pick one again, in theory, pick one of the second round. And I said in that video that I would really like a tall, and I listed a number of key back options that I would be keen us, on us getting. But sure enough, we, we rejected a few trades. We don't know exactly what those trades were, but Rowan O'Brien said that there were some trades rejected. We decided to take this pick. And we took Archer Reed, a 203 centimeter key forward prospect who is a bit of a forward ruck. And um, earlier in the year was considered probably a little bit higher up the rankings and perhaps didn't have the second year of development. Um, I think he had a pretty good underage year or bottom year age year. And then um, his, his uh, draftable year this year uh, didn't quite take those same steps to become like a real top 10 prospect, which at one point it looked like he might. But that's not the be all and end all, of course, because uh, at 203 centimeters, this kid has still got a lot of developing to do physically. At 94 kilos, he's, he's probably got another 10 kilos to put on before he's like fully developed for AFL. So nonetheless though, um, well, a few comments on who, who he is. So he's kind of described as a Rory Lobb type, which as Eagles fans, you might bristle at because Rory Lobb was uh, at Fremantle and didn't really have an outstanding or career at all thus far. far. He's kind of a solid player, but when you look at his profile, I remember at GWS, he was considered a serious, serious high potential gun, and justifiably so. So we don't really need to necessarily think he's gonna max out at 30 goals a season. It just means that he plays like Rory Lobb and has somewhat of a similar athletic profile. Not quite as tall, Rory Lobb is huge. But uh, Archer Reed is now the equal tallest player on the Eagles list with Ruckman, Harry Barnett. Um, and he's not even a ruckman, Archer Reed, but he does play forward ruck. And I think in the modern game, um, players who are that tall, who play forward, if they can ruck as well, that's a big plus. So there's something to be said for that. Um, but what I do like is I, I did want us to grab a tall and I obviously thought a key back was more pressing, but I think we had room for one more key forward prospect. Um, so I don't think this has put our list out of balance at all, particularly when you consider he is very different to the other key forwards we have on our list. 
Oscar Allen's about, what is he, 194 or 196? Um, he grew from about 191 up to being drafted, uh, but still about 196, which is about right for a key forward. Ryan Marrick's about 193 and quite undersized and, and plays more as a lead up, up the ground kind of forward anyway. Archer Reed is the tallest Eagles forward we've ever seen. And uh, in fact, yeah, he's not the tallest player we've ever had. Is anyone taller than Dean Cox at 204 that's played for West Coast? Not sure off the top of my head, but he could easily grow to be the largest eagle ever, if I'm not mistaken. So there's a point of difference there, and he's a very clean and one-grab marking style player. And the Eagles, you know, particularly through that last premiership side we had, the hallmark of that team was the ability to break play up with contested grabs. So if he can at least, he doesn't necessarily have to be a kennedy S forward, but he adds something different to our mix when we're bombing the ball long, which inevitably happens during football games. We've got a player who can take pack marks and break play up, whether it be down the ground or closer to goal. So I like that. I think we had room for a key forward. I think we needed to go tall with this pick, and that's what they did. So then a few picks later, pick, well, a pick, next pick was, was pick 40. What we did here was interesting. We traded pick 40 for 38, and we gave up a future third, which kind of made me bristle a little bit. But when we took Clay Hall, I presume it's because we had some sort of indication that a club picking right behind us was interested in Clay Hall. So we took a uh, young West Australian midfielder, 189 centimetre, to add to this growing list of pretty big bodied midfielders that we're uh, accumulating. Reed, Jinby and Hewitt was already pretty thick with two Cs, bit of height in there as well. And now uh, Clay Hall at 189 centimetres, probably gonna grow to 190 plus, adds to that mix. But what I like about Clay Hall is that when you envisage our next generation of midfielders, there is balance between all of those types with Reed, Jinby, and Hewitt. And the thing about Clay Hall is he's very much a two-way player. He tackles as much as he uh, runs forward. Um, I did a video analyzing him in depth a couple of months back, I reckon. I liked what I saw. He's, he's quite a clean player. Um, probably needs to tidy up his handballing a little bit, but his foot skills in general were above average, I would say, particularly when he gets a bit of composure to deliver the ball inside 50. So I'd say the fact that he's balanced between both inside and out and two-way running makes him a little bit, maybe not unique, but I think that sets him apart a little bit from the other midfielders we have there. So you picture Hewitt and Reed in particular, the damaging explosive players that you want exiting the front of the stoppage um, and delivering the ball inside 50 um, or even right like rolling through the forward line, that's them. Jinby by comparison is a bit more crash and back and defensively minded. And I can see him being a really good midfield enforcer. And you feel like Clay Hall sits in between those guys as the guy who will just get busy and try and extract the ball and could potentially play on the wing as well. So I think Clay Hall could play early because two reasons. He's got a bit of outside game to him, more so than the other three players that I just mentioned there. Um, his work rate to run between contests and accumulate the ball even late in games is a feature. So he accumulates a lot of the footy. And uh, I think he could even start his career on the wing and probably play as early as next year. We'll see. And the other aspect is he's played, well, I think pretty much the entire year, but for a couple of games in the Waffle League competition for, for Peel Thunder, averaged 18 disposals. And I think his second game in the league, he had 27 and a goal. So this kid is going to find the adaptation to the higher level easier than some other draftees, particularly drafted in that range. So I'm happy with this one. It was probably my favorite pick of the draft outside of Harley Reid. And uh, save for the fact that we traded out of next year's third rounder, I'm thinking this guy could be a little bit of one of those underappreciated midfielders who steps up to the level and keeps improving because he seems to just adapt to whatever level he plays at pretty well. And I think pick 38 could be a bargain for him long term, for us rather. So then pick 49, uh, Harvey Johnston. At this point, I was still hoping Zach Ostelski would be picked up. I was liking the prospect of a key defender in this year's draft, and we went for Harvey Johnston, a kid that I didn't know too much about. And to be honest, I'm still kind of getting a feel for him. There isn't a whole lot of footage out there, but the vague profile is that he's 183 centimeters as a midfielder, kind of plays forward as well. And what his attributes are, are being quite quick and evasive, and uh, a good ground ball player as well, which is something that the Eagles historically have been weak in. He has attributes that uh, we have previously lacked. So you can see that we've kind of got a vague profile of what player we want to draft and the attributes they have, and he ticks a lot of those boxes. I don't know how speculative he is going to be. Um, I'd be foolish to try and really give you a good projection of what his career 
would be. Uh, the way I see it is I feel like Clay Hall is a bit of a safe bet, as is Harley Reid. Uh, Archer Reid, naturally, as a key forward, is always going to be a bit speculative, but I see the traits there. And Harvey, maybe a bit like we saw Noah Long last year, we kind of see him as a maybe a bonus cherry on top type um, so that we hope comes good. And, but he seems to have some nice skills, pretty evasive, good decision maker. Um, but doesn't If there was a couple of knocks on him, I think it's not winning enough of the ball. Um, but again, that can be due to position um, if he's favoured or less favoured against some of the other midfielders. Uh, I do know that a, against WA for Vic Metro and the under-18 champs, I think he had a BOG performance with 27 touches. So I'm sure the, the scouts and recruiters have put a lot more time into him than I have. I hope that's true. Um, but th- there's something to work with there. And on top of that, I'll just say that he seems like such a likable kid. Really, really happy to get drafted. And uh, he seems like a really nice guy as well. So I'm happy for Harvey and happy to have him part of the Eagles family, as it were. So that rounded out our national draft. We decided not to take a fifth pick. I don't know if we were ever going to use that pick. We probably were considering it uh, or if we sort of left it there to match an NGA because we did commit to Cohen Livingston as a uh, Cat B rookie as well. So before talking about the the Cat B rookie in Cohen Livingston and the um, rookie selection we took, just to comment on the general drafts, I think it's an interesting mix. Uh, like I said, I wanted at least one tall and we did tick that box. I was probably looking for a key back, but not at all um, disconcerted by the fact that it's a key forward. Like I said, we probably needed one more. And I think the midfielder that we took in Clay Hall is really nicely balanced with other prospects. It's also worth noting he was the only All-Australian under-18 midfielder in the national championships that wasn't part of that Allies team. So... I, I, like I said, I feel like he could be one of those underappreciated, high-performing young talents that steps up to the next level. And through sheer, sheer determination and work, he becomes a good midfielder at AFL level. So I'm quietly confident about him, and uh, I think we could see him early. I can't help but wonder how cool it would have been if we had gotten Harley Reid, Daniel Curtin through that live trade that didn't eventuate, Archer Reid as a key forward, and then taking the Clay Hall and Harvey Johnston because we had the list spots to do it. It would have cost us our future first, but again, I just think that would have rounded out the balance really nicely. Uh, But that's all right. We'll hold an early pick next year and probably take the best available midfielder. And there's some good ones in next year's draft. In terms of players that we missed out on, Zach Ostelski was one. um, But I mean, we took all four picks and didn't take Zach Ostelski. They all happened before Zach Ostelski was taken at pick 51. So it's not just us that didn't think Zach Ostelski was worth a second round pick. The Brisbane Lions have him. Um, but I think for list balance, that would have been that would have been nice. Um, but overall, who am I to say? Uh, so Zach Ostowski was one that I thought I would like at 49. Obviously, Curtin was someone I was kind of hoping we'd, we'd trade live for that we missed out on. Lance Collard, I've been big on him all year. And he nearly made it to us at 28. And I think that's who we would have taken, to be honest, had he been available. St. Kilda's taken the punt there. I think... Not to be disrespectful to St Kilda, but I think that will be a situation that we monitor and see if in three years he wants to come home because there was the homesickness question there. But he's a good player, so I hope he does well at St Kilda, but not so well that he doesn't want to come home. Cooper Simpson at Fremantle, I I think, was another player that uh, I probably didn't actually mention on the channel, but was another one with a bit of upside that I would have liked. Not at pick 30. Um, Obviously, we went Archery to that selection, and I wanted a tall. And to be honest, I probably wouldn't give up Clay Hall for him. But had he been available at some point in the draft, I think he would have been a really nice uh, balance to our draft as well. And Ashton Moyer, another one. He kind of fluctuated in terms of where he was going to go in the draft, at least by media perception. But I can't help but feel like there's a good chance he clicks and becomes a star. He has that potential. And it would have been nice to have him. But oh well, good luck to him at Carlton. With later picks, I had been talking about Will Lawrence, who went to Port Adelaide, and Kay Delarue, who went uh, undrafted in the end. So a couple of late picks there, but obviously they're late speculative picks and I'll defer to the club's judgment on uh, on those picks that they took. So let's talk about Cohen Livingston, a next generation academy talent that uh, we signed as a Cat B rookie. He is a 200 centimeter, 96 kilo ruck key forward. He kind of flitted bet- between the two roles um, playing for the Perth Demons in the Colts competition this year. Uh, he's through the academy because I believe he is part indigenous and I think... It's not just about being part Indigenous, but like I think it's there's a geographical element to it too. Um, so that's why he qualified for our Next Generation Academy. And because he went undrafted, we could sign him directly to our Cat B list, which we've done. So this is a free hit. I mean, I'm not going to uh, criticize the fact that we 
probably didn't need another key forward ruck having taken Archer Reed. This one is a bit of a bonus. And, you know, he had some good output for the Colts uh, team this year. He's not a really athletic player. He's a bit more strong and powerful. Um, but that obviously, that doesn't mean he won't make it. Um, but those are probably his limitations. But he did kick 20 goals for the Demons this year in the Colts competition. Averaged 16 disposals and 22 hitouts in the 14 games he played. So pretty good numbers, pretty good output for that level of competition. Probably going to grow as well. Maybe hits 202, 203. Um, it, like I said, like with the goal situation, it's hard to assess him as a, as a forward because I think looking at the stats, he moved from the forward line and played a bit more ruck throughout the back end of the year. But he did have a six goal haul as well in uh, like round 10 or something. I actually forgot what round it was. Doesn't matter. But he kicked a bag of six and then I think moved more into the ruck. So happy with that one. And you can't complain about having a project haul on the list. We overlooked uh, Oscar Hein-Baston, who was the NGA player that I thought might even go in the national draft. But um, as a small defender, went undrafted and the Eagles didn't pick him up either. So... A um, little bit of a surprise there. He seems like a good talent, got a bit of a reputation for being good. Um, wonder if this will be one of those players that we target for our Waffle uh, Waffle Eagle side um, and see, maybe give him a chance in a year or two. But uh, heading into the rookie draft, we took one selection and it was pick one and we took a player called Locke Rawlinson, another small forward. And again, when you're picking this late uh, or early in the rookie draft, but for these types of selections, it's more speculative and it doesn't really matter about list balance. So we did add another small forward in uh, in Rawlinson, who's 177 centimeters and 69 kilos. Similar to Noah Long, and I, and I keep making Noah Long examples, but similar to Noah Long, he was a midfielder first that converted to being a forward because he was a little bit smaller bodied. Uh, obviously Long had great success with that and Rawlinson did too, to some extent. He's pretty athletically blessed, like he's really quick. He's got good endurance and clean hands as well. So good attributes for a small forward. Um, that obviously come from being a midfielder as well. What he probably lacks at this stage is uh, a strong contested game. Again, he's listed as 69 kilos on the Eagles website. So he's got a bit of growing up to do from a physical point of view. And uh, apparently his kicking can be patchy as well. But either way, another kid that seems like he's got a great attitude and uh, potentially if he applies himself in the same way that Noah Long did and has a team first mentality and becomes a good pressure forward at the very least, then he's got half a chance at AFL level. So overall, I'm happy with the mix. Um, again, like it's one of those things with, with assessing your team's draft. It's like, it's good to be happy, um, but I think if you get too salty because things didn't go the way you wanted them to, uh, you're setting yourself up to look a bit silly, I think, because at the end of the day, we don't know as much as these club recruiters. There's heaps of info and intel that we will never be privy to. Um, so we just have to accept it. And um, yeah, I would have liked a tall, maybe a tall back, but it's not urgent. It's not urgent. McGovern's on a two-year contract. Uh, obviously, Barras has still got a few years left. And then there's Bazo and Edwards behind that. So it wasn't urgent. I just thought for balance, it probably made sense for this draft. What I would say, though, is it's probably now looking... I think we needed to address some forward half issues in terms of young talent. Like when you map out our best 22 that is outside of the best 22, the second best 22, uh, I think we lacked small to medium forward types. We've added Brockman, we've got Rawlinson... Harvey Johnston, you can consider it uh, part of that as well. Harley Reid is going to be a forward half player at times, you'd imagine, as well. And then we get added a key forward as well. So we ticked a lot of those boxes. Now, um, I actually think that where we're going to be looking for in 12 months' time is probably, I think, a key back. I think that's going to be necessary at some point with McGovern going to be 12 months away from retirement, you'd think, this time next year. So a key back added to the list is probably uh, the next sort of uh, spot I would look to fill. And maybe some run out of defense as well, um, because we've got a few types that are out of contract this year, Witherden and Rotham, that could make way. Um, out of the candidates that could be delisted in 12 months, I'd include both of them as needing to prove something uh, to stay on the list, to be honest. I know Witherden has his fans out there, but and he did have a pretty good year, but he, he signed a one-year contract, and that's indication that he you know, needs to have a good year. Uh, so I would also consider as well the last two drafts we haven't added a running defender, um, which is fine. We I wouldn't say we needed one. The only one we did draft was Burgeal, but I would say as well that he was drafted as a midfielder forward and converted into a halfback flanker. So I think that's probably some some the part of the ground I'd address in next year's draft as well. If it's a high pick, you go probably best available midfielder because it's not completely... Um, drafted for yet we still need to build through the midfield as well and when you got a top end pick midfield just makes sense so midfield running and running carry out of the back line 
Um, I'd say outside class as well. So if we're picking a midfielder, I'd rather it not be a big, powerfully built inside mid. Reed Jinby, Hewitt, and Hall, and Cully. Uh, those types are just off the top of my head. You can see how that young quartet could be a powerful on-ball combination. What we probably lack now is real prowess driving the ball inside 50. A Colby McCurchin would have been perfect for all his needs, to be honest. Um, but obviously, you'd, you'd prefer Reed. So I'd be looking at that from a midfield point of view, um, some run and carry out of the back half, and maybe a key back. But the, the holes are starting to be filled. The rebuild is well and truly on its way. And you get the sense that maybe in a, we're maybe a couple of really good drafts away from being able to start bouncing out the ladder again. That's my optimistic view. But last time we were in this hole and we won the wooden spoon, it took three good drafts or four good drafts at a push. So we'll see how we go. We've had three good drafts, I would say, and maybe two more, make it five. And uh, then we're probably well and truly on our way. So exciting times, already looking forward to round one. Let me know in the comments section what you thought of our haul, guys. And um, yeah, Carl the Mighty Eagles. For now, I'll say goodbye and I'll see you in the next video. Cheers.